Good early evening to everyone. Once again, just a, a check to see that all everyone is alert, awake. Good evening, responsive audience. There we go. Thank you. Welcome to our third presentation uh, today. Uh, and once again, it will be deja vu for those of you who've uh, been here previously, but this is uh, necessary for the recordings we're making um, that will be uh, released on Friday. So, um, in August 2016, the school, uh, Faye Jones School of Architecture and Design, organized and hosted a symposium with architects, educators, researchers, raising the possibility that there was a future in timber and wood design and construction in general and certainly in the state of Arkansas. At the same time, we organized and hosted a seminar in Little Rock, working with Governor Hutchinson and our congressional delegation to suggest the same possibility, but in that context to manufacturers, timberland owners, investors, and uh, government agencies that there was not only that possibility of a uh, design and construction future in timber and wood, but a mass timber production future for the state's benefit, both economically and environmentally. And as I think is uh, well documented now, we have continued on this path with increasing uh, enthusiasm and productivity. Uh, our faculty, our staff, and our students have all been part of this journey. And if you uh, are a reader of the Arkansas Business Journal uh, this week, you would have seen the uh, beautiful face of Frank Jacobus gracing the cover of this week's Arkansas Business Journal uh, in his presentation of the future of wood. Uh, an endeavor that he has worked on together with, with many on the faculty, but also Professor Masadi. Nonetheless, this is, uh, has been a focus for us as a school and is now more a, and more a focus for the state. Um, in December, as many now know, not only did Walmart announce it would be constructing a corporate campus of mass timber, but it announced a partnership with Structure Lamb of Canada to uh, start the process uh, in Conway, Arkansas, leading to ultimately uh, a cross-laminated timber production facility that will start rolling panels, if all goes well, in uh, January, a year from now, for code certification, and then to roll the code-certified panels in the summer of 2021. So we are working in the state and regionally and nationally with increasing productivity and impact as befits a public land-grant university and a public land-grant school of architecture and design. All of this has led us in part to this period now where we look ahead to a new building for the Faye Jones School of Architecture and Design, the Anthony Timberlands Center for Design and Materials Innovation, which will address in part our expanding enrollment, our expanding programs, our expanding ambitions um, in a 50,000 square foot, $16.5 million facility in what is now the emerging Wingate Art and Design District on uh, sorry, between Government Avenue and Hill on Martin Luther King Boulevard. We are very grateful to Chancellor Steinmetz and Provost Coleman for their support of these initiatives. We are very grateful to University Facilities Management uh, not only for our work, but also for their support of the other mass timber buildings that exist on this campus, the Library Annex Building and Adohi Residence Halls. But in particular regard to our building, we're very grateful to Anthony Timberland's company, and in particular to John Ed and Isabel Anthony, who, are, uh, who ha have uh, provided us with the seed funding, significant funding, matched by the university, in order to move forward with this initiative. But this competition, in fact, is uh, enabled by uh, a grant substantially funded by, first, the US Forest Services, and secondly, by the US Endowment for Forestry and Communities. And this is what has allowed us to first write an RFP last fall 
that produced 69 submissions. And from those 69, allowed us to select six to move forward into this finalist period. Um, I'm grateful to the work that our building project committee is doing. And I'm also grateful very much to the exhibition team uh, of the school who has put together a very fine exhibition of all six finalist submissions for us to view until spring break. The building, as I've said, and the competition uh, is, uh, that uh, is leading to that building is really intended again to focus on a center for research and development in timber and wood products. It's planned as an important extension of our school and a key part of the university's Wingate Art and Design District. That district, as you know, is now a new southern campus in the city of Fayetteville for the university and includes buildings for the School of Art and university libraries. The new Applied Research Center will serve as the epicenter for our multiple timber and wood design initiatives, will house our school's existing and expanding design build programs and fabrication technologies laboratories, and will serve as the new home to the school's emerging graduate program in timber and wood design. The six finalists were selected based on the design excellence of the individual architect or practice at the national and even international level as well as demonstrated achievement in innovation with materials and construction. All six finalists are accomplished in both professional practice and architecture education. Uh, our third presentation and our third finalist uh, today is uh, Yvonne Farrell presenting on behalf of Grafton Architects. Grafton Architects is a Dublin-based architecture firm founded in 1978 by directors Yvonne Farrell and Shelley McNamara. The firm has developed a rigorous and sensitive approach to architecture that builds upon the essential character of place with deep consideration of scales ranging from the texture of surfaces to urban interventions in the city. Grafton Architects has produced an internationally recognized body of work that is designed to enrich the human experience. Quote, for us, architecture is an optimistic profession with the opportunity to anticipate future realities. It is of the highest cultural importance because it is the built enclosure of human lives." End quote. Grafton has built an impressive portfolio of educational buildings across the globe, including the Università Luigi Bocconi uh, School of Economics in Milan, Italy, completed in 2008, the University of Limerick Medical School in Limerick, Ireland, completed in 2012, and the university campus UTEC in Lima, Peru, completed in 2015. The firm has been recognized with numerous awards, including the World Building of the Year Award and the inaugural RIBA International Award. Next week, Yvonne and Shelley will travel to London because Grafton Architects has been named the 2020 recipient of the RIBA Gold Medal. Please welcome the 2020 RIBA gold medalist, Yvonne Farrell, representing Grafton Architects. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you for that fantastic introduction. Before I begin, I am honored that your gold medalist uh, has entered the room, and I would like to congratulate him formally in front of everyone. Uh, I, I was talking earlier on when gold medals are received, gold dust sprinkles around the community of architects around. So it's a credit to you personally, and also uh, it shines a light on uh, Arkansas and on Fayetteville. So congratulations uh, to you, Marvin. Um, I would also like to thank uh, somebody in the audience. Uh, there's a Hannah Both who uh, arrived over the, over the mountains uh, to um, our model arrived from Dublin. And let's put it this way, the first sign I saw when I arrived to the airport was a, a, a twister shelter. And I think the model experienced its own twister between Dublin and uh, Fayetteville. And Hannah, by her training and her skill and her dedication, within a number of hours transformed uh, blitzed and uh, hurricane and twistered uh, model 
into uh, something that represents us. So thank you, Hannah, for your skill. Thank you. Uh, um, I'm, uh, as, as Peter has said, um, my name is Yvonne, Yvonne Farrell. We're based in Dublin. And uh, I'd like to begin by just, I hope this works from this position. Or do I have to do it backwards? Oh, very good. I'll just give you a, a short description, really, of some of the projects that, uh, that we have been involved in. Uh, Peter referred to Bocconi University in, in Milan, and uh, we won this by competition in 2002, and it was uh, about 200 meters by about 80 meters uh, uh, in the city of Milan, and they needed a thousand offices, a room for a thousand people, five uh, spaces uh, for about 300 people, and all of those places, uh, the big spaces, had to be underground. And we asked the question uh, that we couldn't bring ourselves to make black boxes into which people would spend their hours in the large volumes. So we developed this uh, idea of matrix of bringing uh, like periscopes of light into the big uh, volumes, but also it was about uh, Bocconi University had already got planning permission for a building on that site, but they themselves weren't happy about uh, what the building was saying. And for us, we often use the phrase that architecture is a silent language that speaks. And as architects uh, in the room and training as architects, that we, if you like, make buildings that communicate to the general public, either uh, physically, subliminally, or uh, very much uh, in terms of speaking, uh, but silently. And this space on the left-hand side is the undercroft of the, uh, the Aula Magna, the big hall. And what we uh, did there was we made a cantilever of uh, 66 uh, feet, which cantilevers out over the city. And there's two things which I'd like to speak this evening uh, about. One is that we often uh, quote the Spanish architect Alejandro de la Sota, and he says that architects should make as much nothing as possible. And when he talks about the nothing, he's talking about the, the space in which we stand. And when Shelley and I were asked to be the uh, curators of the Venice Biennale, we chose the topic of free space, where we wanted to focus on the space of architecture rather than architecture as object. And the space, the free space of this Bocconi building on the left-hand side, your, this uh, glass screen is uh, um, 24 feet high. Uh, it does two things in our reckoning. It allows you, as a, a, a somebody standing uh, 15, 15 feet down below the city, that you're both part of the university and you're aware of the city itself. And when you're uh, a, a, a citizen of uh, Milan, you're able to see into the belly of the university itself. So when Peter referred to other universities that we have done, universities to us are unbelievable and really important institutions in the 21st century. They are the places where the ideas of the future is made, and all the students that are here in the, uh, in the audience, you are the makers of a future, and you are highly privileged to be trained as architects. It's an amazing profession because we do make the, uh, what we call the new geography. It's the places in which people will live. For us, we made this space. We used a structure to cantilever. We uh, connected the city with the space below, and in terms of materials, the material is Cepo, an ordinary stone of Milan on the main part, and below is this beautiful white marble called Bianca Laza. And we lined the lower levels going five meters down, the 15 feet going down another level. And we've discovered that light bounces, that we were worried that light would not penetrate the lower level and the lower level again. So in terms of uh, how then people, this is on the right hand side, is a photograph that somebody sent us years uh, later where economists are having a party and they have hired uh, people on stilts to celebrate the, um, this, this space. So it's wonderful for architects to make the stage on which life happens. This is a project in, uh, in Lima, Peru, where uh, it was a country that we had never been to, uh, neither Shelley or I. One of our architects uh, had been, and she had spent a month in that uh, fantastic country. 
And what was amazing is to listen to stories of people who travel to that country. And she described the, uh, the, the people, uh, their habits, uh, the, the kind of life uh, that is lived in, in Lima. And we discovered that Lima is 12 degrees from the equator. It should, it's a desert city. It should be absolutely roasting. But because it's on the sea and because of a von Humboldt's uh, current that comes up from, uh, the, uh, from Antarctica, it's, it's kept at 20 degrees Celsius, approximately. It does have fog, uh, which makes the light there very, very, uh, it actually accentuates the fog, and it affects the back of your eyes sometimes with its in intensity. But the site was really for a new university on a very tight site on a motorway. So we asked the question, uh, could it, uh, a university be an arena of learning? Could it be like a stadium? If the temperature inside and outside is really very benign and you can have, uh, it's the same as inside and outside, could you have all the spaces that don't need to be inside, could you have them outside? And we, uh, working with the client, all the circulation in this building uh, is outside. And what is really interesting is that, you know, when I, this is my first visit to Arkansas, and wearing a snow coat and hat, you realize that every place is a consequence of its uh, climate, and that, if you like, culture develops because of the things that you can do and the things that you cannot do. So what we did in, uh, in Lima, we asked the question, uh, could uh, a university be uh, an arena for learning? Could it be a, a stadium? And we use the building like a carved mountain. This is a concrete building where the, uh, if you like, the peak cap at the top here uh, protects against the very high, uh, very high um, intensity of sun, and it protects the interior. So this, the interior is like a, a carved. It's like you're in uh, an interior of a mountain. And when Shelley and I were there, when they had taken down the, uh, the, uh, the uh, concrete uh, shutters and the space was uh, revealed to us for the first time, it felt better than we had imagined because it really protects you. You get light, but you also get a protection from the high sun. So this is uh, UTEC. This is a project um, uh, that we have just finished in the beautiful city of Toulouse uh, in France. And Toulouse is called uh, La Vie Rose uh, because it has these absolutely beautiful uh, bricks. Uh, but the tradition of the building industry now in France is that instead of using real bricks, there's these things called plaquettes, which are really like tiles. And the, the materiality then of uh, of the, the brickiness of brick is lost because no matter how good your jointing is, you know instinctively when a tile is a tile and not a brick. So when we won this, there was a competition, uh, which we did, on a magnificent site. I was saying to people earlier on today, it is on near the Garonne, which is a beautiful, huge river, near uh, Canal de Brienne, which comes in from uh, the outskirts of the city, um, curves, uh, carved stone. There is a, a, um, um, a Romanesque church, a, a five meter high medieval brick wall and a cloister. And we were just saying if you were a teacher and you gave those uh, conditions to a student, they'd kind of say it's a bit on the heavy side of all the goodies that you wouldn't believe it as a site. But this was the site of the competition. And what we did was we looked at all the pieces of Toulouse, the uh, courtyards, the um, uh, the wonderful um, uh, structures of their cathedrals. And we made a, a building uh, here, which is, um, we use the, the fire escapes to form a type of enclosure. Uh, for the, so these are all the uh, buttresses holding the building. And this is a, 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 these connect uh, upper levels forming the entrance. And it's a, a, the brick, we, we refuse to, to, to go into the, to the plaquette and to make the applied uh, tile. And we found within a very short distance of the city of Toulouse, uh, a, a factory that made bricks in the same way in the tradition of the Romans. Uh, you know, and the, you know, one of the main guys missing a kind of one or two fingers in kind of a, in the history of making things, bits of him were missing. as kind of proof of his uh, craftsmanship, let us say. But what is really interesting is that we found people who make real bricks 
and the bricks that are uh, made in this building for this building are beautifully crafted. And this is just, just opened. So the exterior is a brick crust and the interior then this view from the competition is really, a, it's a concrete structure that allows us to frame the views of the spaces uh, that are beautiful in Toulouse. So each of the, the, um, uh, uh, the cuts are views so that we, I suppose, believe that architecture should heighten your sense of place. So that when you are a researcher in this uh, building in Toulouse, from your office or from the collective spaces, that your uh, relationship to the city uh, is heightened. This is another building we've just finished. So we love this project here in Arkansas because we have teams ready to go. But this is a, a, this is a, a building in um, uh, Kingston, which is uh, still on the River Thames in London. You can, from the upper floors, see Hampton Court, the beautiful complex, uh, brick complex also. But this is a, a, a university where uh, it was really a completely crazy brief. They wanted uh, a library and they wanted uh, studios for urban dance. And urban dance is one of the, the highest uh, uh, decibels in terms of the noise that dancers make in urban dance. And this was for us a fantastic overlap of education, where traditionally libraries are uh, the kind of silent places uh, that, that people go to, and dance is something that's uh, kind of hidden away. And the educational brief and the discussions with the client and the, the, uh, the time spent in finding an overlap of uh, architectural ideas and spatial ideas has meant that this building that's open about uh, two or three weeks now, the library is absolutely full of students every day. Uh, the uh, relationship to the dance is really strong. And in terms of university education, which is about overlap. So instead of you doing one discipline and one discipline only, you might be sitting at your uh, desk studying and through various uh, windows and uh, sections, you see the dancers practicing or you see the dance uh, uh, happening. So by virtue of section, uh, university acts. And then here on the right hand side, so sorry, on this one here, this is about connection to Kingston. Kingston is very badly damaged by uh, road engineers having their way for many, many years. And this is really the, the beginning of civilizing. Here we make a, um, a colonnade, a landscaped space which connects uh, a, what used to be car parking in front of other buildings. There are existing buildings, are existing trees which we have kept. So the, the circulation, the main circulation, which moves up uh, six stories in the building, is the place where students uh, see each other and meet each other on the, on the staircase. This is another building which we've just finished just outside Paris. It was a competition we won for a place called Saclay. And the, uh, the French, in the kind of tradition of the kind of grand idea, they uh, decide that all their um, uh, technical universities would move to this place. It's a plateau about 25 minutes by, uh, by car from the center of, of Paris. And it's, it's like Silicon Valley, if you can imagine it, on a, on a plateau. And bit by bit, they're doing uh, uh, universities and student accommodation on this plateau. And this was for... Uh, absolutely hundreds of uh, research offices uh, for uh, auditoria, uh, lecture theatres, uh, student, uh, student uh, services. And they wanted a hundred uh, natural trees uh, as part of this structure. And because it was, if, if you like, out uh, in a nowhere for some years as they build, we chose the, uh, uh, the monastery as a, as a reference type and had a series of courtyards in the idea. And the biggest courtyard, which is here, is the one with real ground where the hundred trees will really grow. grow. And under the other courtyards is the place where the, um, uh, where the car parking takes place. So essentially, in section, it's car parking, uh, real ground, moving up all the shared uh, services, um, auditoria, moving up to the research laboratories uh, in this place, Sackley that also has just opened about uh, just before uh, Christmas. And just in, in summary, before uh, I go to this particular project here in uh, Fayetteville, it's really that uh, 
from our office point of view, and as Peter has referred to, uh, since we opened our office in the 1970s, we've got more and more committed to the, uh, to the term, I suppose we use, that architecture is the new geography, that since 2008, more than half of the world's population live in cities. And so what we do as architects is really a geography beyond architecture. It's what encloses people's lives. And this is a small project here, the stone building in, in the streetscape of Dublin, where we take limestone from a quarry in the middle of Ireland and transform it to a city uh, building. And the limestone on the building on the, on the right-hand side is a medical school in the University of Limerick, where there's a colonnade for the kind of wet, it's wetter in the west coast of, of Ireland. Uh, in terms of what we call a vessel of light. In terms of uh, timber research that we have uh, been doing, th this is something which we are particularly interested in. It's, it's, uh, it's really looking at uh, uh, structure and small-scale structure. This is what is known as reciprocal structure. And if you see the diagram up on the right-hand side, you see that small elements can form a six-meter grid. You can move to a 12-meter grid, nine and 12 and three. 16, so you make this, uh, 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 if you like, conglomerate of space with very small elements. So these are the, if you like, uh, studies of timber spaces that, uh, that we have been involved in. And this drawing is a drawing of, uh, uh, there's a fantastic uh, architect in Switzerland, uh, Cien uh, Kamenada, and uh, Shelley and myself uh, have been teaching all our architectural lives um, as well as practice and looking at uh, the work of Kamenade in detail. This is a, a hand drawing done by one of our students we teach in the School of Architecture in Mendrisio in Switzerland. And this is a, a Struckbau. It's a, it's a form of construction uh, of a project that um, uh, Kamenade has done. And these are it's nearly, it's, it's bigger than full scale here on, on the screen, but these are big sheets of brown uh, paper where students are encouraged to do the drawings there to, to physically, uh, uh, to, to react to uh, buildings uh, in, in the presence of the building. So when we were uh, um, uh, lucky enough to, to be participating in your uh, competition, obviously uh, we had known about Faye Jones, but uh, just looking at, uh, Fayetteville and the position here in terms of where the center uh, will be. And at one level, at the moment, it's a, it's a satellite from, from, where, from where you are. And the great, I mean, we had always known about this uh, building. Um, it's part of uh, architects' repertoire of beauty. And it's just extraordinary uh, when you look at the little model here in the, in the library, just as you walk across, you realize that was an architect working and making that model is really very beautiful. It's very tender in its uh, exploration. And as you just walk casually through the library, you see this, uh, this piece of uh, somebody's thinking. And so the first thing that we did as strangers to your, uh, your part of the world was to look at uh, what, what kind of, uh, what's it like in an uh, Arkansas uh, summary. And we were astounded uh, by the blue over there because when you come from Ireland, you kind of go, you nearly apologize when it rains. But it, uh, it rains in other parts of the world as well. And what we found about whether it's true or not, what your data is really saying that it's all through the year, and sometimes it comes very heavily. And we found this interesting because there's some of the most beautiful drawings, some of the uh, ancient Japanese drawings of, of dealing with uh, rain or looking at uh, rain is absolutely kind of the, the sky crying, it's, it's very beautiful. And we can, uh, as architects, we also had a conversation during this competition that there are places in the world where, uh, like a, a Villa d'Este just outside Rome, where in the heat that the, the section and the spray uh, of tiny particles of moisture on your skin means that the atmosphere is affected by, uh, by, um, by water. And we then thought that we have to think seriously about uh, Fayetteville and rain and how do you deal with roof. And one of the things about roof is that it is the membrane between the earth and the sky where uh, it's a kind of permanent umbrella. So these were the studies um, uh, the, in terms of, of, of rain. And the other thing was the 
uh, amazing fact that 57% of your state is covered in, in trees and that the, the range of trees is absolutely fantastic. And uh, we had never, I had never actually seen the bark of the, um, the hickory tree. And it's absolutely extraordinary. I mean, you want to, not that I'm a public tree hugger, but there are some trees that you just want to go up and touch and hug because they are incredible things. And in terms of the whole issue of the generation, uh, the younger students here and, and us as, as a kind of a, the older generation, that you are heading into a world where sustainability and respect for nature is not just something that we can casually kind of be say yes or no, Sustainability and reuse and regrowth are fundamental to the way that that's why we're doing this competition because it's also part of the research about how we deal with resources, how we deal with reuse. And this, uh, this image here of the black walnut tree or the oak or the hickory, um, that they are uh, extraordinary creatures that are part of the pleasure of our world and not just for us to be under their shade uh, in the summertime, but also for you know the, the the descendants of reptiles that we call birds that give us uh, pleasure uh, all through the, the season. So it's it's part of our. I was on the podium one time with a Canadian scientist, and I, I don't have his paper, but the case he was making is that one tree can change you know, so many you know, aspects of a person's life. Two trees can double it exponentially, and that you know there's kind of scientific proof that. Uh, trees have a, have a benign effect on uh, social behavior and that you could, anyway, that's a whole other social kind of study, but just to say that trees are good for you. <laughs> and uh, 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 the, the other thing, I suppose, because we're strangers to your uh, shores, uh, that, that one of the things that's amazing about images like this is the the kind of purity of, of expression. Here is a use that was, uh, you know, other than it is needed now. But these forms are really very powerful because they needed something and they needed something else and then they needed something else and they just did it and they weren't sitting by with an aesthetic uh, 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 committee deciding on whether something would go here or there and it turns out to be absolutely fantastic as a, as a phenomenon. So we were looking at this tradition of, uh, of, uh, of roofs, of uh, need, uh, that were transformed into architectural form. And in the, the, the brief or the schedule of accommodation, I'm not sure what uh, term you use in the United States for all the things you need, because what's really interesting about architecture is that we're not sculptures and we're not artists. People come to us with needs and we have to transform needs into space, into a functioning uh, new reality. So uh, the, the phenomenon, these sketches are really us saying they need a, um, a big room. This yellow is representing your fabric uh, shop. These are the smaller rooms of, uh, of classrooms and uh, library. And, and uh, this is the beginning of saying you could have a south-facing structure which uh, gets north light into here. You could deal with the, uh, the, the, the rain that happens in, in Fayetteville in an architectural way. So these are our first uh, uh, ideas. And I'll just pass it around. Um, I don't know whether, I, I presume everybody has taken the jam off their fingers. Uh, I'll, I'll pass these around if you want to. These are paper models um, done, there are others, but I only carried this little box on my, on my transatlantic flight. Uh, but these are just the, the beginnings of uh, architectural studies, which are saying you need these rooms you need to protect from the, from the rain, and can we make uh, something out of the roofscape that has some sort of uh, uh, meaning to do with water. So I'll, I'll pass these around if people want to, uh, to, to have a look at them. These are very early studies, and they're, uh, they're not what you call um, convincing, but what they do is they, they start with an idea of um, uh, uh, roofscape, and that we would use what we call uh, the, the, the water gutters. Uh, I'll give them to the gold medalist. I should hand them like a Japanese uh, person with two, with two hands. Um, but essentially what we're saying is that there's, a, when we looked at the, the context, and it was very interesting standing up in um, uh, Martin Luther King uh, uh, Avenue, 
uh, this afternoon that it's a very busy thoroughfare and it actually is a satellite. I mean, it is, it's not what you call urban at the moment. It will take time for it to become uh, a, a precinct. But you can imagine a building uh, on that main thoroughfare having some sort of presence and that as you go down Government Avenue that it would be quieter and that within the, uh, um, sorry I put it down here, within the block that you have, um, it's a bit like a, I think it'll be a bit like a monastery for some time. And going back to our project in Sackley, it will need to be somehow self-contained until uh, other parts of the city uh, really reach it. That if you're going down there as a student, um, that it will be, uh, so these are, sorry, these are the, uh, the models that are being handed out around us studying roofscape and us studying form towards the city. And then these are the, uh, the, the studies of uh, section. Um, we often say that the, uh, a plan is, is really a, a, a logic, but that the section is where the uh, em emotion uh, lies. And that here in the, in the section that you what we're saying that the workshop should be on the ground floor, that, it, that there's a change of level uh, from uh, Martin Luther King uh, Avenue up here and it drops to the service uh, route here, that we have the auditorium looking into the workshop and out onto the street, that our laboratories and classrooms move up through the building and that you, uh, you make a roofscape that uh, protects from the, um, from, from the south. And looking at these studies, we're really saying that uh, if the sun is here to the south, that we protect as much as possible, that we get as much daylight into the, uh, uh, to this uh, space, this fabrication shop. And what we really decided as a group was that the, the, the fabrication shop was, um, you know, could so easily be a separate building and you'd have all the classrooms separately and that it becomes like a, a, a yard, but that as a university and as a new facility, that it had the capacity to be uh, uh, understood and uh, related to in the upper floors. So this is the, the idea of a, a large-scale room which looked out onto the city, looked out onto uh, Government uh, um, uh, Ave uh, Avenue, and the boulevard al along here was another view, and that you get uh, uh, south light. These are the, the studies of this uh, space that you had a relationship out to uh, Martin Luther King uh, Boulevard, that you made a public window like in Bocconi that people could see in, that you'd have uh, an exhibition space. Your main uh, auditorium would be both to city and to this space here, and that socially students would be aware of the workshop uh, uh, simultaneously as they're studying in classrooms and laboratories uh, and the library above. Um, the most important uh, in terms of the urban structure of, the, of this place was how you were going to relate. This is an early um, information uh, 3D that was sent to us where you've got the various sculpture, um, you've got art and the uh, printmaking and graphics and, and this, subsequently this building was taken out of the urban plan. But for us, the busy uh, roadway, the secondary route, the service, and then these cuts, uh, student cuts, and the change in level. And this, this became the one that was the most uh, advanced as we, as we made the, uh, the competition, where the, the site was extended uh, from here on the corner, but then also there was this existing services block that was asked to be kept. They weren't going to be moving these uh, electrical uh, ones here. But what is fantastic is that you're, you're sloping from the west down to the east, so you get this uh, line down to, down to this, uh, this position here. So what we did and on our boards on the exhibition, we switched the, the plan around, making sure that we um, uh, you know, put where the, where the north is, that at this junction, that this junction here, that this building would be one of the first buildings to kind of mark this uh, city block and that we'd place the, uh, the new uh, uh, center uh, on this position, and that we would think about the internal structure of this block as a teaching uh, space. So from the upper uh, western end moving down, that over the uh, services that we would uh, encase them with, uh, with uh, steps, and that brings you down to the lower yard. That yard feeds into the one of the new building, this part being covered, this is the service uh, off Government Avenue, um, and the, this is the access road, 
and that, that the main space of the uh, fabrication shop would be visible on this, uh, on the Martin Luther King Boulevard. And the entrance then would be, there's the student entrance as well, and we'd, we'd call this the uh, Anthony Way uh, after the patron, and that you'd have two entrances, the main public entrance here and the student entrance here on the upper level, coming past the exhibition and arriving into here, and at this point being able to view down into the uh, fabrication shop. These then are, are diagrams describing the, the, the student uh, movement coming through the, the laneway up further. And these are teaching spaces outside, in our view, the steps down to the lower court, the pedestrian entrance for students and exit and the, and the public service entrance uh, from here. And in terms of section then, that you, uh, you have the upper part of this, the, the, the new block that it's lined with uh, trees. What is very beautiful here is the fact that you could have a whole um, uh, array of, of trees, like an alphabet of trees, and then you move down to this teaching space into the fabrication shop with the, uh, with the building uh, there. So what we were, when we were looking at this uh, building impacting on that uh, corner, that you would have a sense of both the, uh, the busyness of, of this, uh, this road that you would have a way of viewing in, that you would have uh, these uh, vertical uh, trusses uh, protecting you from both the, the western uh, and the eastern sun, that you would have this cascading roof which links the space of the, the fabrication shop educationally up to the other uh, uh, teaching spaces, but also uh, baffle the, the sun and only letting the sunlight and view where we wanted it to happen. Otherwise, these are north facing north facing uh, roof lights. As you come in then on the service route that you come along to the yard, the yard is shared by all the other disciplines in the, in the block that this is the covered uh, working space into the fabrication shop and students as they're going by, I mean in the same way like in Kingston, we really do believe that uh, going to university is really the, uh, an incredible part of one's life but also that the overlap and discovering other things is, uh, uh, happens uh, in section and happens uh, by design. So we had hoped that uh, students coming from uh, other art disciplines are looking down at architectural students making or that art students are also using this facility and the exhibition space is up here and you get people uh, wondering about each other's uh, work. So here are students on that upper level looking down at work being made, looking into uh, these are very early studies of our, um, of our proposal. This is on the side route that you, when you come in from Martin Luther King Boulevard, this is what we call the um, Anthony Way uh, to, for the, the patron uh, of the building. And as you're moving in from the, from the street, uh, from the boulevard out here, you're, this is the student entrance with uh, exhibition. Down there, you're looking down to the yard and you get uh, glazing on the lower level, the roof protecting you, the, uh, the, uh, what we have as the, for the water uh, collectors up above here, and then these are the, uh, uh, the protectors east, east to west. So along here, this is a more detail of the plan, the upper route, the stepping down amphitheater over the electric transformers to a lower court, the Anthony Way, which is a way in from the, the, the boulevard, into the main entrance and into the student entrance and linking up within the, the central heart of the courtyard. And we hoped that along here that you would have uh, all the kind of species of trees that are samples that uh, students would become very uh, um, uh, connected and informed of the trees itself. This is our, our uh, if you like, our, our functional section on the lower level, the fabrication yard and fabrication shop with the view out to the uh, Martin Luther King uh, here, that you uh, have a, the auditorium, which is here looking into this space, moving up classrooms, laboratories, uh, design studios, uh, a library, which is in this position, and then for people who are invited uh, to come, uh, residents would be uh, on the upper level. So this uh, section describes that again, Anthony Way entrance, move up to auditorium, uh, classroom, uh, um, laboratories, design studios, which uh, are, uh, we'll show you in section, uh, are taller, the library, and then the residential. 
And here then is a, a tall exhibition space that's on view uh, on, the, on the corner. So this view is really describing uh, the, the atmosphere and uh, light. Uh, I, I suppose what we are saying is that as you move into uh, the making of, uh, of timber buildings, that what we are proposing is that this is timber in its rawest, that it's not that you send for a flat pack to Austria and build a building within the kind of traditions of uh, so-called kind of industrialized timber, that there's part of those kind of structures, but really what we're saying is that we uh, make the elements of structure, of timber structure, more visible. So here we have, these are uh, uh, oak uh, columns, uh, composite columns, which are um, uh, every 7.6 meter. Then we have, uh, sitting on them, these uh, glue lamb uh, uh, troughs, our structural engineers describe them as canoes, they're the canoes up here that catch the, their water uh, containers. Off those ones, then we have these uh, smaller uh, trusses which are holding that roof and holding out the, the positions for the glass. And here, where we have our biggest space, which is the uh, auditorium, we're changing the structure to a, a, a queen post truss. And just in terms of structure, we would love this building would be a place where you would bring um, uh, students, where you would bring people to see not only the, the quality and smell and tactility of, of timber, but also in the variety of uh, structural possibilities that timber can provide. In terms, this is our, our plan of the, uh, the ar arrival level. Students come in this way and enter into this uh, upper level. That's the exhibition on view from here. You view down to the fabrication shop, which is here. You arrive on either side, on the west and on the east, are uh, uh, elevators and uh, staircases. When you arrive to this point as a guest, there's a staircase or elevator that will bring you up. And over this space, hanging over this space, is the... Um, uh, Sorry, I'm bringing you down first of all. You go down to the fabrication shop. You go down to, uh, to restrooms and uh, lockers into this space and you move out to this uh, fabrication yard, the lower yard. In this one here, we're saying that maybe underneath that, that you could uh, introduce some of these uh, smaller units and here would be the, the people who, when stuff is being delivered or when they're uh, keeping an eye on uh, machinery that's being used, that that is really a control, a control office. So this is a, a study view of ours where you're down on the fabrication uh, level, you're seeing out onto Martin Luther King, you're looking up at the auditorium, you're seeing the Queen uh, Post Trust uh, holding the um, auditorium up above so students are aware from the auditorium about here as an educational space People are arriving from the other art disciplines to this level, seeing what's going on, and uh, the other teaching spaces are, are up higher. Here's the level of the auditorium in section, which is here. You move up through a, a, a public stairs, which is this one here, or the elevator, onto this space, into the auditorium. So you're at this level here. Here, you're on uh, one of the uh, levels over here towards the east. You're looking down to the fabrication. You're looking at people arriving from, uh, it might be Jonathan and his daughter, uh, arriving into this space here, um, that you move and see the auditorium uh, and see the other levels of students higher, uh, higher up. At the next level, we have a classroom. So there are four classrooms off this gallery, all viewing down to this uh, shared uh, atrium. So here you are as a student on this upper level, you see into the uh, master plan of the inner uh, block courtyard, you're looking down to the um, uh, fabrication shop and you see these composite columns as they move up, uh, as they move up the building. Laboratories, design studios, the library, and this is a view of the, the library, so you're, uh, you're looking out to Martin Luther King down below. You're using uh, this structure to, uh, uh, if you like, make you aware of the lower level, the design studios uh, below you. 
and on the very top floor we have two uh, apartments. They, you arrive by lift and stairs to this apartment with uh, living and sleeping with your own courtyard and on the other side the same living and sleeping with your own courtyard. Two private, two private ones. So in terms of section we have the clear uh, fabrication shop below a double height that brings you up to the auditorium and moving up uh, through, the, through the building. A view of the, the gantry, like one of the things that's really important is the six meter high uh, movement of this gantry in this space to the various, to the various machines. The, the last few sections that I'll show you this evening are really uh, our work with our structural engineer, um, Mark Wickby. And uh, if we were going to be working with you, we find uh, this uh, uh, structural engineer uh, a fascinating uh, man because he's, uh, he's worked with uh, Eric Perry where uh, uh, he's made a, a, a contemporary building with mass stone. Uh, he's working with David Chipperfield in Edinburgh in terms of uh, 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 concert halls. Uh, in terms of engineering, he asks questions which are really fundamental. And it's not about moving into making uh, timber the equivalent of concrete uh, uh, fabrication, but ask the questions about what, what we can get from tradition and uh, express in, in, uh, in, in timber. So what we're doing here with him is our, what he calls these uh, canoes for the water, the trusses which are forming the cascading roof, and the queen uh, post truss which allows us to have the uh, open span for the, for the auditorium, which is hanging uh, from, uh, from this space over the, over the fabrication. And these are his drawings where he's taking the, the watercourse um, uh, structure uh, spanning over the fabrication shop, looking how it would be for, it, it, this is eight meters, 24 and eight, but we have it as um, 18 and 10 and 10 uh, with these spur, uh, structures which hold them in this composite uh, uh, structure. And these are our, uh, our drawings describing these uh, canoes in which the, we hope that the roof would be a, a shingle roof um, uh, and that we'd have these uh, opening sections uh, which are uh, protected from the south sun because they're facing, facing north, uh, that they would open and be ventilated. We know that this would be wider for, uh, uh, for maintenance. And this is us describing the structure in more detail. The purple being the uh, white oak uh, columns. This gantry uh, along here, which is a uh, hickory, that we have glue lamb beams uh, here, that we have softwood trusses in the green, these green guys uh, uh, as we go through, and then that we have these uh, uh, queen post truss uh, holding this. So essentially there are uh, three systems. And this is, we liked this diagram in terms of the, the making this column uh, take the, uh, the gantry and as it moves up through the, through the building, obviously, it, it diminishes in size. And taking from history, these are our studies of the, the structure of the, uh, uh, of the main, uh, sm the smaller teaching rooms. And I suppose what I'd like to, to describe is that what we really believe is that, that architecture and uh, structure uh, are really uh, uh, good twins. What tends to happen in many contemporary work, or much contemporary work, is that structure is hidden and not part of the architectural spatial uh, um, um, uh, decision making. And what we would like in this building, if we were involved in it with you, is that there's a sense of uh, shipbuilding, that there are other traditions that that the training of structural engineers uh, means that we can work with another kind of invention, that it doesn't mean that we're doing a concrete building and changing it just to wood because it's Arkansas, but that within the discipline of timber and within the history of timber, that we can bring it into the 20, uh, 21st century. And these are our structural engineers' drawings of junctions, of uh, knee joints, uh, of diagonals, and looking at our model, uh, which um, Hannah both uh, uh, returned to its uh, structural uh, position. And the reason we, we made it this way was to express the, um, the, the first architectural and structural moves to do with uh, space containing uh, 
uh, and uh, the umbrella, if you like, of the space, and that the, the other screens of uh, elevations would be added as layers to this, but these are the primary, the primary moves uh, of, the, of, the, of the building. These are studies that we did, um, obviously, as we we're uh, developing it, and working with uh, Ivan Ivanovich, our uh, environmental engineer, uh, with uh, uh, Atelier 10, who are based in London, uh, also have uh, firms in, in New York and doing work all over the United States, uh, really looking at how, the, how we deal with uh, natural cooling, how we deal with uh, uh, solar protection, how we deal with, uh, with uh, hot air and uh, as hot air rises. Uh, so we have a concrete uh, base uh, which uh, is both uh, heating and cooling into this uh, large scale space. Our studies for, for the elevation, our uh, thoughts about how we, how we make, these are uh, other structural studies that we did during the, uh, the, the course of the, the competition making simple uh, uh, trusses uh, to hold the uh, north-facing uh, light to make these uh, canoes uh, uh, for water in terms of our uh, front elevation. It's interesting in terms of, of water, it's something that we, we didn't pursue in detail, but something that is really very important, how uh, universities deal with uh, natural water, whether you just uh, put it into the general system or whether there are other ideas uh, for holding water, purifying it, and reusing it in terms of grey water. We put this image up. It's a, it's a, a building we love very much uh, by the, the Danish architect uh, Jorn Utzen. And just in terms of it being like a barn on the outside, it's not a very pretty looking building uh, from the outside, but spatially it's extraordinary in terms of its simplicity of light and its uh, uh, sense of uh, uh, of control. This is a, a, the sacred space of, of this complex, which is the concrete folded cloud-like uh, roof. But for us, there's something in the, in the way that uh, the, the, the building that we have designed uh, for here feels li like that. And I know today is raining and it's threatened snow, but this is an image that we thought would be, as you walk down Government Avenue, that you would, you would see into, into the uh, fabrication shop, you'd see the students moving up and that this cascading structure like a, a, a waterfall uh, of light was something that you would be um, aware of uh, in this kind of, uh, in this terrain. And I see it everywhere now. We thought we were finding something really special. If you turn it sideways, the building looks like the map of uh, Arkansas and now I sit and have coffee and it's everywhere. So I apologize for that. Um, we thought we were finding something. Oh, the Mississippi looks like our roof, <coughs> but in fact, it's uh, it's something that's uh, in the coffee shop. So, um, if you can be mortified by sitting there and see it, anyway. And um, what we thought was really very beautiful about this map, uh, this is the soil map of your state, is uh, just the range of soils to do with deltas and rivers, and just that uh, from uh, an architectural point of view, that trees grow above ground because of what is below ground. And we are very interested in the, uh, what, we've run a program last semester called Below, uh, In, On, Part Of, because all those prepositions are really what we do as architects. We embed things in the ground, we make foundations, we, uh, we carve, and then we make above. But what we liked just about was uh, this, um, you know, we thought we were discovering it. So we discovered that everybody in Arkansas has done this, so yeah, okay. Um, our final, our final uh, image for you this evening um, is really uh, to do a resume. When we were doing this competition, um, we wanted to think about uh, timber as being versatile and not timber to be only consumed by the building industry. And I know there's a gentleman here from the, I uh, met earlier on, uh, in terms of the, the industry. And what we would like to discuss in relation to the industry is that it's not that you have to get everything flat packed from Austria. That if there are uh, beautiful specimens of timber in this state, that it would be amazing to make a building which is a sample of all those spectacular pieces of timber 
and that they are given the place within their structural capabilities uh, as part of the repertoire of the spaces of this building. I refer to a building in Trinity College in Dublin, which is by the firm Dean and Woodward, and it has all the stones of Ireland as part of the surfaces of the building. And you can go into the building, uh, which is a museum, and you can point to that beautiful one, that beautiful one, that beautiful one, because that's the nature of that building. And our proposition for this competition is that you could make this useful building do more than just be the building, that it could also be like an encyclopedia of the beautiful range of trees that you have in the state, and that the structural capacity of each of those, and the smell of them, and the touch of them, and the grain of them, gets embedded in your uh, kind of physical repertoire. And that the, what we would love in terms of the other disciplines in the block, interior design and landscape, is that landscape is not just teaching us about making something pretty, but just what we can grow, how we can have the pleasure of it, and that how we deal with spread of flame, how we deal with acoustics, how we do deal with finish, becomes something is the biggest repertoire for the timber industry. That it's not trying to stuff timber into some flat packing, but that it actually, that architecture tries to release the, the beauty and strength and structural capacity of timber within this exemplar building. So thank you. Okay. Questions? Questions? Uh, coming from right and left. Let's start to my right, and then we'll go over to Brian. Oh, a fun microphone. Um, cool. Uh, so, uh, obviously, there have been steps taken towards making this adaptable to a changing environment with sustainability efforts, obviously, throughout. Um, what sort of adaptability efforts have been put into, as you mentioned, the changing urban landscape of MLK, of the Arts Corridor, of the growth of the school as a whole? Um, just, taking the, just taking, sorry, the sustainability of, of timber. I mean, what is really interesting is that the elements, depending on your junctions, that you can undo the junctions and all the, there's a beautiful image, uh, I actually meant to put it together. Uh, there's a beautiful image by, uh, the Reed, by Rietveld of his timber chair, and there's all the pieces of the, of the, the standard pieces that Rietveld made the red and blue chair uh, of. And what I love about it is that you put out all the, the pieces and you see the, the, the two flat pieces of ply and the, of the softwood, and what, it's a great trick to do, actually. You say to somebody who's not an architect or not in design world, and you point to the chair and you say, when do you think that was designed? And they go, mm, recently? And it's 1916. And I find that amazing that somebody can take uh, standard pieces of uh, timber, transform them into an incredibly comfortable seat, but that is a piece of art. In terms of sustainability, to answer your question, to me, it's, it's also about the jointing and sustainability. What, the reason why we I thought that we would enter this competition and then thankfully at this stage to be part of the last six is that we do feel that uh, architects do need to research deeply into how timber becomes part of our lives. We're also, you know, when you read about sand, I mean, we do a lot of, of uh, uh, building in concrete. Uh, the, the project that just finished in Kingston is a precast but really, really slender uh, precast concrete. So we try to go to the minimum now of the materials that we use and that spaces are less defined. In, in Kingston, many of the spaces can be other things, that there's a, there's a sense of open planetness that can have versatility. But in timber, it seems to, it seems to us that it's also that the jointing, if you can unscrew and undo, you can do it like the Rietveld chair. You could dismember and I think um, uh, Hannah uh, both is probably a, a specialist now because she actually took our, got our building 
the Irish expression is it was in flithers, it was in bits. So she got all the bits together and put it together again. So it's like Humpty Dumpty, you know, it, it, he fell off the wall and uh, Hannah put it back together again. And that uh, it's, it's, if that is true then, if the building did need to come apart, you could technically unscrew each of the pieces. So those big glue lamb canoes could be taken down and could be reused. It's not like the composite structures of, of, uh, of, of, uh, of traditional building. And that's the point, I suppose, of the discussion earlier on today and now, and what we've been uh, discussing in our office, that, that uh, the, the, the architectural profession does need to take sustainability, not just um, kind of superficially uh, to their heart. When we were doing the Venice Biennale, the last, uh, the last discussion uh, we had was named uh, the Earth as Client. And in our manifesto, we had um, a really called on, this was back in, nine, uh, in 2016 when we wrote it, but now you see somebody like uh, um, uh, the Swedish activist, you know, 16 year old in her yellow coat standing there and it's fantastic uh, saying the things to an older generation, what the hell are you doing? And the, sorry, at the, the, the last discussion in the Biennale, we invited Mary Robinson who was president of Ireland, but then uh, is now, has an organization called Climate uh, Justice. And we asked her to be part of a, uh, a discussion group. And she uh, came, and she had never been to an architectural biennale, and walked around the exhibition uh, before the, uh, the day before. And she tore up what she was going to say, because she discovered by virtue of seeing samples of what architects do, that architecture is an optimistic profession. It does try to think of, of solutions for the future. And a school of architecture is going to build the future, and the discussion has to be on sustainability. And that's why this project is an interesting one, because it's asking architects to think about timber really fundamentally, not just make timber, you know, new or buildings that look like all the other ones only please do them in timber because it's kind of more sustainable. I think what's really interesting about the question of this competition is what is, what can a timber building be? Uh, what, how sustainable can you make it? That's why it's something we would like to pursue but didn't go very far in dealing with water. The whole issue of how you'd, if you have a lot of rain here in Fayetteville, where does it go? Do you just let it go down the drain? Or could you hold it somewhere and make swales and lakes and, you know, could you do something with it for grey water? You know, there's a whole... Um, we did a project with students last year and we insisted that they were self-sufficient, that houses were self-sufficient from the human... I don't know what you call it here, but the, you know, the unspeakable things that we have to deal with as humans to drinking water, uh, to uh, uh, heat, that you, you really know where they go. You just don't put a pipe there and it goes somewhere else. We're responsible for the somewhere else now. And I think that we nearly have to think about total uh, uh, self-sufficiency in each place that we deal with. But it's your generation. That's, that's an answer. Yeah. That's an answer. Um, I thank you for bringing those models and uh, the process drawings were beautiful. Um, as a student here, I'd be curious, projecting forward, um, I wrote it down, um, how, how would you, how do you see the design process or the process in general, um, like engaging the school and uh, the students as well? Um, I think that's what the, I think that's what your dean wants to happen. You know that um, I don't know about you, but when I was a student, uh, you know buildings arrived. It's like you know you weren't told about the stork. You know buildings arrived fully formed. Ta -da! Here they are, and then you you see a really terrible model by Le Corbusier. You know it's great when you see a working model that even somebody who made like in the Carpenter Center, there's a, which is an amazing building. There's a really kind of, 
what I would call really, you know, basic model. But it's really reassuring that you see models that are terrible. I made a terrible model of this project that's in a kind of a place over in the, in the, in the office. I can't make models that I'm handing around like that. That's Don Hurley here in our office. You know, my models are so embarrassing that you have to hide them. And that I think that uh, there are different skills, and that's what's amazing about uh, an architectural atelier, that, that you can do something I can't, and vice versa, and that architecture is a highly collective uh, endeavor. I think that schools of architecture, the reason why Shelley and I have always been teaching is that it's a two-way thing. We're practicing architects. We're very privileged. We uh, have access to education through our lives, and we are building. So we want to try and explain what that is. It's not easy. It's really not easy, but architecture matters. So it's really that kind of dialogue, and that sometimes you make a little model, like some of the, the three that went around there, so the two are kind of, you know, iffy, but we, there was a question this morning, how did we kind of, you know, come with the kind of blanket uh, canopy, this, this cascade? It's really that we didn't want the fabrication shop to be the fabrication shop and then the, the, uh, the, the other rooms stacked, but we wanted some presence on the city. And actually, I was walking up here, it was interesting today, just walking up here today with all the school buses and things coming down, well, if this is built first, this will really have that elevation on show. And it's a bit, it's a bit of a satellite place. It'll take 10, 20 years for that to be, you know, uh, urbanized in, the, in, a, in a very dense way. So this will be a kind of a, an outlier uh, for a while. And your question about how students uh, and architects interact, I think that um, uh, it's really watching process. We, in University College Dublin, we used to have a, a, a program called a Diary of a Building where you, you watched the, the, um, the process. It was interesting in Kingston, what Kingston University did was they kept on the jury uh, of the competition through the design process and they had a number of meetings where the jury kept an eye on the university to make sure that the, that the essence of the design was uh, continued through the process. That, that had never happened before. I mean, we do a lot of competitions and we're, we're building them. Uh, the building process is interesting. Uh, one of our directors and I were looking at the competition boards for Kingston uh, and uh, the building that's now opened a few weeks ago. And the essence of a building does survive. And the, the dialogue between planners and client and users enriches uh, a process. Like it's interesting in Bocconi, Hardly anything changed from the competition to the, uh, to the built. Uh, the client needed some more offices, so we hung. The structure of that was every 25 meters, uh, diaphragm walls. The, we had our beams on the roof. We hung metal rods. We hung the offices. It's kind of crazy. We hung the offices from the roof in order to have a varying soffit. And the only thing that changed from the competition to the building was that in a, in a few cases they needed more offices. But the process, the, I, I think the process could be, um, we're practicing architects that want to communicate with you as the next generation, but like your colleague over here, you are into another world of sustainability. So you have to watch this generation, like uh, Greta Thunberg, you challenge us, you know, and, and, and that's why we're doing competitions like this because Peter's right that timber is the way forward. Um, we have to use our resources architecturally. It's not like, oh, concrete building, but I'll do, it in concrete. I'll do it in timber quickly, and it'll be lighter. But when you look at projects that are done with timber, like there's a beautiful project um, in mud and bamboo by, um, she's a German uh, architect, um, his name I can't remember tonight, sorry. Uh, but it's really very beautiful, done by local labor in, uh, uh, I think it's in Bangladesh. But it's, uh, it's, um, it's beautiful. Uh, it doesn't have to be that you do a mud and bamboo and it's, 
it's just, you know, it's for poor people and therefore it's poorly done. You can actually make incredible things with very simple materials taught in a particular way. So the process, your question about process, I think that, uh, that the, whatever project wins, uh, watch how it develops, how it survives the, the pulling and dragging of educational dialogue with, with the client body. And as students watch it construction, that there's a thing called value engineering, which should be renamed as skin in a cat or taking all the flesh off a chicken. Because value engineering is not the term. You have to have very good clients that hold on to the essence of something. You can whittle something down, and you don't have to have too much money. You have to have the right amount of money within reason, within a building industry. We're, we're doing a lot of, um, we do a lot of educational buildings, and the, to build schools in Ireland, there's very little uh, funding for them. And it put the pressure and the contracts, the pressure is enormous on architects to, to make, you know, the, I don't know what the expression in Arkansas is, you know, to make a silk purse out of a sow's ear is, a, is an expression that's, that's used, I don't know what's used here, is it? It's actually exactly what All right, okay. <laughs> Yeah, well... We got it from y'all. We got it, is it? We got it from y'all. Okay, thanks. But it's, it, that's what uh, building is. It's trying to use very limited uh, resources well. And from architects to student architects, there, there is a, a stand in buildings and uh, watch what happens and dig. What we get our students to do is to do three separate things. What are the foundations when you dig in? Like uh, the, pro the project there with um, uh, Kamenada, the, the beautiful models a student made of, the, of the, the concrete holding into the ground, the timber structure separately, and then the roof, because in the snowy parts of Switzerland, they keep the roofs uh, cold so that the snow acts as insulation. So you get three, those three elements. And we're a great believer in foundations, middle and top, like a, you know, like a good hamburger or something that you think of buildings you know, because they affect one another. We have to put on our, on our concrete or on our oak beams, we have to have, the engineer wants us to have, uh, you know, 75 millimeter high concrete shoes. We'll be fighting that one a bit, but, um, but uh, it's, it's a great process, I mean, being an architect, but it's, you need other level, I mean, you have a, a, a you know, a, a, uh, architecture is very high quality here in, in Arkansas. You have a gold medalist in your room, and uh, you know the aspirations are very high. So, but it is you're into another world of sustainability, water, materials, electricity. Um, it's it's really serious. Other, other hands, questions. Did you have a question? Yeah, I was wondering if I could ask a question if no one else is going to ask one. Uh, I, it's really a twofold question. It's very specific, but I, I wonder how you're thinking about this. And I realize this is conceptual. So, but I, I love the specificity of the hardwood trees that you showed, that are very, you know, very much part of uh, our forest, uh, mostly hardwoods. Um, I was wondering if you, as you think about the shingles versus the vertical surfaces and so forth, have you been thinking about species? And then in turn, have you been thinking about how the screen goes dark? Uh, how, have you been thinking about uh, how would, how, your thoughts on how this might weather? How it might weather? How it might weather, yeah. Uh, it has a, a wonderful monolithic quality about it. And so I just, wonder it being wood and most likely I, soft wood rather than hardwood I would think but I don't know um, I just wonder if you've given any thought to that um, there's a um, the 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 repertoire of of woods um, is something that we would love to choose carefully from here you know we would need advice as well but we thought it would be amazing to have a building that had different smells in different parts of it, that, that it had different textures, and that you could point 
to, to places that it was exemplar, that, that, uh, um, that we would get advice from people like you or uh, people who know it here and know what the atmosphere here is. We don't have, a, like there's a, there's a very beautiful building in Trinity College by de Blockham and Marr, who are a very good uh, uh, architectural firm in, in Ireland. And they timber, because of our atmosphere, responds differently in, uh, to, I presume, here in terms of what it would be like. It would be interesting to, going back to the student's question, uh, you know, anticipating it five years, 10 years, uh, 100 years, what is, it, what is a building like uh, here? Um, the, what we loved about the shingles idea was really that you would use every piece of the, of the tree that you'd, you'd, you'd have it somehow, that the bigger ones were able to do this, but by the time you chopped it down, that the, that the shingle, that would be like an instrument. And one of the things we wrote is that we're particularly interested in the relationship between musical instruments and wood, that the sound of, of instruments is, is so related to the choice in violin, in, uh, in, uh, in, in other uh, um, uh, instruments, that, that maybe in architectural education, that we really study the architectural timber education, we study the relationship between sound instrument, music, and space, how the varnish, how, how that industry or that art form has developed. And in terms of, uh, to answer your question about being outside, I remember cycling in a very heavy rainfall at home and wearing full rain gear and, you know, uh, having proper um, straps on, the, on your wrists and thinking that every student of architecture should be forced out on a bicycle in rain gear to realize what it's like to be a building. And I think that it is important that we look at how buildings fare over time. It'll be a very interesting exercise. I don't know the answer. Um, how do you varnish? Do you don't varnish? Uh, what are the traditions here? I mean, there are basket makers, I'm sure, here that could uh, advise on how things survive outside, or there could be studies by the students uh, around the country, or sorry, around the state, uh, about how things survive. But it would be a tradition that would be worth tapping into from our point of view, um, because the atmospheric conditions here are very different to other parts of, of the world. We've got just a very few minutes, and uh, even without a, an image still on the projection, uh, hopefully it's been a memorable evening altogether. Is there any last question? Yvonne, I know you've given us a, a summary statement already and um, left us with a great deal to think about. Would you want to add any uh, punctuation to this uh, exclamation point? Uh, I'd just like to thank you for inviting us to participate. Um, it uh, opens up uh, whole areas of research for us. Um, in terms of every building is very specific to its culture. Uh, I think it's a really important moment for the timber industry. I think in terms of schools of architecture, it's a really valid, deep piece of research. So um, it's been a pleasure to uh, come here and present uh, to you. I think uh, Jonathan's daughter gets an award for staying awake. Uh, and, um, and just to wish you well in all your studies and with all that you do. So well, I want to th thank you on behalf of the school. <coughs> I, think, I think we went into power save mode, so everything shut down. But uh, I, I do want to thank you on behalf of the school and, and the university. And um, we... Uh, have some difficult decisions in the days ahead, obviously, but uh, we will not only wish you well on your travels home, but we will also congratulate you now for the honor which you're going to receive in London next week as a RIBA gold medalist. It's a great privilege to have you here visiting and sharing your work with us, so thank you very much.